Welcome to a special edition of the Addiction Connection podcast. It's September, which is National Recovery Month. But if you're an addictions biblical counselor, it's National Transformation Month. Because remember, Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. What you're going to hear is a testimony we recorded at this year's annual summit event in Cincinnati, Ohio. Volunteers were willing to come into our studio and share their life story of their life before Christ and their life after Christ. That's the hope of the gospel, is that we are sinners in need of rescue by a Savior who was perfect in God's eyes and satisfied God's wrath. Jesus did that on the cross. He died. He was buried, raised from death to life. And now he lives and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's paid for our sins. So that's why it's important that we consider addiction as a sinful heart desire problem. Because Jesus solved that problem. Enjoy this testimony now of God's faithfulness and amazing power to transform the human heart from sinner into someone who wears the robe of Christ's righteousness. CJ is going to share with us a portion of his transformation testimony, some highlights with us because it's National Transformation Month for Addiction Biblical Counselors. So CJ, tell us a little bit about some of the highlights of your transformation story. All right. Well, I want to start out with a Bible verse uh, that says in Proverbs, it says, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. And that's really the overarching uh, theme verse for my testimony, because from a very young age, I bought into this lie that I was destined to be a modern day Jesse James or Billy the Kid, some sort of outlaw. I kind of bought into that just glorifying that and thinking that was what I was destined to be. And that obviously sent me down a trajectory that wasn't good uh, in life, just getting into trouble. I was just always kind of kind of a thrill seeker, looking for thrills in all the wrong places. And, uh, and I didn't have a real strong church background. I knew of God that there was some sort of, I kind of had this belief that there was some sort of creator, but had no concept of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And um, so I just kind of had that, that was, that just drove me. I ended up getting into drinking at a very young age, drinking, uh, just getting into trouble in and out of juvenile detention centers. And then that led into jails, prisons, it just continued to down spiral. And, uh, then I was, then the drugs came in and methamphetamine really had a stronghold in my life. And really it was just me seeking to fill that void uh, in my life with anything and everything but God. And I was trying to find answers in the world. And then all that, so like in and out of jails and prisons, and just when I wasn't in prison, I was really in my own prison uh, just because I was in bondage to sin, even though I couldn't have articulated that to you then. But uh, in April of 2004, that all came to a crashing halt, uh, got into a high-speed chase, uh, um, and I tried to commit suicide by cop. I'll spare you all the details, but it was really, you know, I was in a dark, dark place and really putting not only my life in jeopardy, but the lives of other people, just the way I was living and acting. And, and then that, in that chase, uh, by God's grace, I made it out alive, obviously, or I wouldn't be sitting here with you today, but, uh, I ended up going to County jail been there many times. I remember sitting in jail thinking, boy, CJ, I, I was just wallowing around in my self-pity. And I was thinking, boy, CJ, you are a loser. You couldn't even get yourself killed right. You know, anything that you pursue, it never works out. So I'm kind of just sitting in there just miserable. And I'd been in there about two days and they told me I had a visitor. And uh, I was shocked when I went I said, okay, I'll go to you and I didn't know who it would be. I thought maybe it was my dad or something. Really didn't want to hear the lecture. And I walked into that room and I could not believe my eyes. It was, I didn't, hadn't seen this woman since I was 12 years old. Her name was Elo Reynolds. And she was right around 90 years old at this time. 
and she was my childhood babysitter. All the town partiers, and my parents were those partiers, uh, some of those partiers would take their kids to Elo's house when we were little kids, uh, and she would babysit us, and she would always read us Bible stories and make us, you know, spaghettios and bologna sandwiches with way too much mayonnaise on them, <laughs> and she'd pray for us and encourage us, but her house, really looking back, she had all these wild kids staying at her house, and she was a widow. She loved Jesus. Her house was a mighty mission field, and I didn't know it. You know, I just thought she was the crazy Jesus lady. But here she is all these years later, 27, I'm 27 years old this time, and she comes to the jail to see me, and she says, CJ, I just, she says something along these lines. CJ, I've prayed for you for years, and I've seen your name in the paper, and I just... God laid it on my heart that I needed to come tell you this today. And she laid out laid out the gospel very simply. And then she just told me, she said, CJ, the reason you keep running your head into these brick walls and end up in these places and nothing's going your way is because God's trying to wake you up. And, mm. and she shared, like you said, shared mm. the gospel very simply, very plainly. And for the first time in my life, I'd heard people talk about Jesus before. And I was just like, yeah, that's for weak people to need a crutch. I just didn't realize that I was one of those weak people that needed the crutch. And she said, she said, uh, you know, I mean, I, the, the first two thoughts were though, was this is really true. And the second thought was what in the world took me so long? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like the light went on and I went back to my jail cell. She left me with a little Bible. I still have the Bible today. It's like a little truck or something. You get at a truck stop. Mm -hmm. and, and there's just this little Bible of new Testament Psalm and Proverbs, and then she had all these little sticky notes in the John 3, 16, and some of the famous verses. And I remember I just going back and reading those verses on the jailhouse floor and repenting and believing that day. Mm -hmm. And that's when everything radically changed in my life. That's when my life was transformed. Mm -hmm. But I always tell people, I came to know the Lord in April of 2004. Mm -hmm. I surrendered, I repented and believed. I have no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I thought... I kind of had a Burger King uh, concept and idea that I thought God was, you know, I could just have it my way. You know, mm -hmm. Burger King, you get to have it your way. I found out the hard way. That's not the way the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords works. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I didn't know what I'd gotten myself into when I first came to know Christ, but he's been faithful since that day. And he disciplined me when I did try to do it my own way. You know, his discipline brought me back to repentance. And mm -hmm. by God's grace, now I'm, it's just crazy to think that so my wife uh, married me and I mean, I got out of prison for the very last time in 2008, met my wife, was plugged into a good solid church, was just serving faithfully. If you were to tell me back then that I would be serving as one of the pastors in our local mm -hmm. church, Redeemer Church in Winterset, Iowa, and uh, also uh, leading a ministry at the Refuge, which is a men's residential discipleship program, and just being a part of the Addiction Connection team, mm -hmm. I just think you're crazy. Mm -hmm. But this is what God does. Mm -hmm. He takes He takes the foolish things of this world, mm -hmm. is what First Corinthians says, and he, he uses them for his glory to confound the wise. And I'm thankful to be a recipient of that kind of grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that was awesome. Thanks for sharing. It's National Transformation Month. And you were somebody who would have been labeled in what ways? Hopeless. Oh, yeah. Lost cause. Lost cause, right. rebellious, all those kinds of words that we use today about people that we think there's no hope. Right. They would have also said the term that some people would have said was that he's institutionalized mm -hmm. because I couldn't stay out of an institution. That's the only time I can do pretty well. You did well in the institution, right. but outside of that, you were freedom. We had a hard time yeah. until Jesus came yeah. back and then changed change at all. And what a blessing, Elo, just a uh, nine-year-old lady comes to see yeah. you yeah, and says the reason you're butting your head against the wall. Jesus. Jesus. Man, well, that's awesome. And and it's 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 why we're doing what we're doing. And we're going to hear more transformation testimonies as we every day of this month, just to encourage us and God is still in the business of transforming hearts and lives. He's done that for me. He's done it for you. And I appreciate you sharing. Thanks for tuning in to this podcast. And remember, God is still in the business of transforming lives. Take care and God bless.